Okay, it's recording now. Okay, so let's continue our discussion on dynamic optimization problems. So in the previous class, we talked about first order necessary conditions for optimality. So we have xk plus 1, xt plus 1. xt plus 1 equals ft of xt comma ut. And we had the performance index j as a function of u naught to ut minus 1, which was g capital T, x capital T plus summation t equals 0 to t minus 1, g small t of xt comma ut. And what I want to find is, so in order to compute the optimal action, what I need to do is find the gradient of j. And what we showed in the previous class is that this gradient is equal to uh, the gradient of ut of ht, where ht is defined as a function of xt, ut, and pt plus 1, which is ft, xt, ut, transpose pt plus gt, xt, comma, ut. Okay, so this is known as the Hamiltonian. Okay, or PT plus one. Yeah. So this co-state vector is uh, defined for time t plus 1. This is the current cost. This is the current state transition function. And this is how you define Hamiltonian. And in fact, we had a recursive equation for pt plus 1. So we have pt equals gradient of xt of ht at xt, ut, and pt plus 1. Okay, so this was the recursive equation for PT, the co-state vector. Sorry, what's the question? How do you initialize? Oh, P capital T? Yeah. P capital T is gradient of X capital T GT at XT. And what else? Yeah, that's it. So it's the gradient with respect to the uh, final state of yes. the terminal cost. Okay, so the gradient with, uh, so PT is always the, well, yeah, this is not the cost, yeah. So PT is the, the, the P capital T is the gradient of the terminal cost, and PT is the gradient with respect to the state of the Hamiltonian, which involves the running cost and the state transition function in a product with the co-state vector, okay, at the next time step. So, if you want to compute the optimal control action for a problem of this type, so you want to compute the optimal control action, which means you have to run the gradient descent um, in order to do that. And if you want to run the gradient descent, you want to compute the, how does the, 
how does the gradient of uh, j, which is the overall cost function, change with respect to ut? And then we went through a long derivation to simplify the entire uh, the process of computing the gradient. And the way we, I mean, we went through a lot of man mathematical manipulations in the previous class in order to come up with what is known as Hamiltonian. And once you define the Hamiltonian, then you have an update equation for the co-state vector. And by taking the derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to u, you actually get the derivative with respect to, sorry, you get the derivative of j with respect to ut. So j is, of course, this whole cost, whereas Hamiltonian, in some sense, is defined using the current uh, state transition function, current running cost, and then a future co-state vector. Okay. So how do you compute the gradient? Uh, you first uh, get the entire u vector, so u0, which is u0, 0, 0 u10, all the way up to ut minus 1, 0. Okay, you define these uh, entire uh, set of control actions over the entire period of time, and then you compute the state using the state transition function, then you compute the co-state using the backward iteration, um, and, and then you get the derivative by taking the derivative of the Hamiltonian itself. Okay, and then you update the control action by defining u t comma k equals u t comma k minus one minus alpha k minus one gradient of u t of h t evaluated at iteration k minus one. Yes. So then let's say we are trying to determine the optimal set of actions to cause the you know Apollo eleven whichever one of one is land or land of the moon. Mm -hmm. If we start, and let's say for some reason we don't appeal to some kind of domain knowledge, mm -hmm. if we start with our initial guess for the set of uh, actions, yeah. then it's equally likely as not that we will end up crashing a land. And so then we mm -hmm. start doing iterations, always affecting the entire set of actions. Right such that eventually we no longer crash the land? So uh, that's a good question. So his question is whether we will cra crash land if we are starting with some random initialization which doesn't have any domain knowledge. So the question is, the, the idea is that land, so crash landing is more of a function of the objective function rather than your initial guess. Okay, so let's say I don't want to crash land on Mars. I'm going to have a terminal cost that says that the velocity at final time has to be equal to zero. Okay, and if my velocity is not zero, then I have to pay a huge price. So, um, or, or rather you would say that my, so let's say I have to define my GT of XT. Let's say XT is just the velocity. Then I'm going to say, I'm going to have the velocity as, I'm trying to think what function blows up to infinity very quickly around zero. I mean, of course I can have xt square, but xt square is not a good, it blows up very smoothly. Uh, I want to find a function that goes up to infinity very rapidly. Can someone think of? Okay, what about e raised to x t square? Okay, so that goes up very quickly, around zero. Or if I want to be more, more risk sensitive, I'll have e raised to e raised to x t square. Okay, that blows up even quickly, around zero. It goes to infinity very quickly. So you know, it's, you have to design your cost function in order to not crash land, okay? So, so there is, so, so yeah, so coming up with initial guess, a random initial guess will just mean that you will reach Mars in one million years instead of seven years, mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with crash landing, 
okay, if you haven't designed your, if you have designed your cost functions properly. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so uh, since we have a fixed number of steps yeah. uh, to get there, right. uh, I, I don't see how this models the length of time it would take a rover to get there well. All this right. seems like to me a, as if you had uh, the, the arc you wanted something to take going to the moon, right. and you're saying at the different inflection points, or, yes. or at, at the different points throughout, uh, what corrective action do we need to take to the path we've already given it? Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, here, of course, we have a fixed terminal time. You can have formulations where the terminal time is uh, flexible. Okay. And that's not, we're not going to teach that in this class. But it's, there is certainly a formulation out there where the terminal time is not fixed. But all, all these algorithms are, are uh, you, you're standing on the ground saying, I need to give the, the computer the course for how to get right. where it's going. Right. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a fixed endpoint. Uh, we're not going to wind up with a solution that doesn't get there. It's a computability issue. Uh, if we don't have domain knowledge of it, might take us a thousand years to give right. the rover the solution, not uh, once it's in space for it to get there, correct? Uh, can you say your question again? Your question is pretty long. Okay, so, <laughs> I need well, to parse through it carefully. With yeah. how we're talking about time for this algorithm, since it has yes. a fixed horizon, essentially, right. the, the uh, time that it could take forever would be, if we don't have domain knowledge, getting yes. a, a right answer, yes. and not once we've launched the rocket, we've right. already given it the information it needs to have, it will right. get to uh, right. Mars on time. Right, 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 yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, so this is a, a restricted version of what is known as maximum principle, uh, which I'll cover in the next class because I want to introduce dynamic programming today so that you can complete your assignment in time. So. In this particular situation, of course, you're computing the, so let's say your J was convex in all these variables. So what that meant, what that mean is, if I run the gradient descent, I converse to a stationary point and it is optimal. Okay, it is globally optimal. And what I get is uh, U1 star, sorry, u0 star all the way up to ut minus 1 star. Okay, I get the optimal set of actions that I need to take in order to minimize this cost function subject to the state transition constraint. This is what is known as open loop control because the control action is not a function of state. Okay, it's not making use of any information about the state that you might be getting from your sensors. What does it mean in reality? So I plug in these actions on a rocket. Okay, so your thrust should be this much at the ground, then you go to 100 meters, your thrust should be this much, then you go to two, no, actually not 100 meter, 200 meter, because I'm not making use of the, uh, the state information. So all I'm saying is at time t equal to zero, this much should be your thrust. At time t equals one, this much should be your thrust and so on. Okay, all the way up to time t minus one. What is the problem with this approach? Not you, somebody else. What's the problem with this approach? Okay. Yes. Is it that you're only accounting for the action that you're going to take? Uh huh. Uh huh. So, so you are saying that we are taking only actions, and what's the problem? Well, you're trying to find the optimal set of actions. Yes, right. as a function of time. As a function of time. Yeah. So you're only really, you're not depending on the states. Yeah, you're not making it dependent on the state, right. yeah. so you're only depending on time. That's so right. There could be other inputs or out, out inputs to or outputs from the system, like something could happen to the amount of fuel. And so mm -hmm. you need some way to check how much fuel is left. Right. So if you say output 200 grams of fuel and you only have 100 grams of fuel, right. then you're going to need some way to check to see if you okay. have 
Okay, perfect. So his point is that you may not have enough fuel at some point of time while taking the action. So there may be some problem which you need to have some course correction based on whatever updated information you have. I was going to go with open loop control is only stable so long as it has all the conditions are perfect. Yeah, but we are not talking about stability here because it's only a finite horizon. So stability is usually taught when you have infinite horizon. So you want the state to be, it shouldn't blow up in finite time. Okay, okay so stability is not an issue right now for this formulation. Okay, so imagine this situation. You asked me, I want to get to high street. And I'll tell you, oh, get out of the building, take a right, take another right. So take a right turn. So okay, not get out of the building. At time t equal to zero, take a right turn. At time t equals to five, take a left turn, and you will reach high street. Okay, and, and walk for 15 seconds, and you will reach high street. Okay, let's say I give you this instruction. It's not informative, because you might bump into something, or within five seconds, you may not be able to reach the correct turn, and so on. So open loop control is a problem when you have uncertainties in the system. Okay, and there is always some uncertainty in the system. If you're launching the rocket, there is a lot of atmospheric uh, winds that you need to account for. And if you put open loop control, then your rocket might not even reach the destination because in the middle, there'll be a lot of noises that, noises in the sense of wind that will move the rocket in different directions and therefore your rocket will not get to the intended destination. So in some sense, open loop control is not a good way of controlling a system, especially a safety critical system. So since we keep using the space program as an example, yeah. were any of the rocket launches in the space program actually done using open loop control? Or th this, this <laughs> program? That's a good point. Uh, we'll get to it in a, in a bit, maybe two, three classes later, okay. when I talk about um, actual implementations on real systems. Basically, in, in those situations, you compute this again and again. So you run this algorithm in real time in order to compute the optimal set of actions given the updated information. Okay, but we'll get to it in a bit. So what we would ideally want is a way to get information about the state and then take the action. Okay, which means what we want is an optimal policy which maps the state information to action information. Okay, so let's talk about that next. So the goal is open loop control is bad. So, well, the conclusion is Open loop control is bad. Need closed loop control. Okay? And so the goal is find, so compute optimal. policy gamma star t that maps x t to u t. Okay, so I want to find a policy wherein I plug in the state information which I could get from my sensor. So I'll have an altitude sensor, I'll have fuel sensor, I'll have various kinds of sensors all over the place, uh, pitot tubes and whatnot in order to compute everything in the state space. So I'll know what the airspeed is, I'll know what, how much fuel is left, I'll know at what height I am at this point of time, I'll know what's my la longitude and what's my latitude is based on the GPS systems and all that stuff, okay? So I'll have adequate number of sensors in place in order to compute the entire state. And once I know the state, I need to plug in to this optimal policy so that I know what action I need to take and then I'm going to take that action, the state will transition, and then I'll, I'll have policy gamma star t plus one, where I'll again sense the state, plug the state in the policy, get the action, apply it again, and hopefully it will minimize this 
whole objective function. Okay. So I am going to define the new uh, j, which is the total cost, as a function of gamma naught to gamma t minus 1, which is g capital T x capital T plus summation t equals 0 to t minus 1 of g t x t gamma t x t. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is a function and you define another function that takes as takes into um, yeah that, that whose domain is actually functions which are policies. So typically you would call such a thing as functional and not function, but it's all fine. Mathematically it all makes sense. And so this is why policy is hard. Yes. Well, uh, we'll get to it in a bit. So this is known as cost functional. OK, so suppose uh, somebody gave you this problem that open loop policy is bad. I need closed loop control. So I need to compute the optimal policy that minimizes this whole objective function. What would you do? Well, question first. There's okay. When we're dealing with uh, the modeling that transitions the sensor data into you know, the input functions for updates, uh -huh. where do we attribute the uh, uh, lack of perfect knowledge to? Do we say it's in the sensor model? Or, and if the information we get from the sensor is accurate, our policy will be accurate? Or, or and, and that's where we build in the fault? Or do we say it's not going to be a perfect model, it's just going to be the best model and our sensor information? You know, let's not, let's not go into sensor faults and sensor errors, because a lot of bad things can happen if sensors, don't, if sensors fail, okay. basically. And then what you have to do is known as information fusion. You should have statistical information about what the sensor noises are, and based on that, you will do information fusion. If some sensors are bad, you will remove that data from your information fusion algorithm and Okay, so the assumption Try to is do that recompute. The, the yeah. input information we have is perfect. Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. Our, our model yes, work. that's right. That's right. Okay, but sensor noise is another big problem which I don't want to get into right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I assume the gamma t um, it was defined so you can map the state <coughs> information to the optimal u of t. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay, but but here you have the option of doing course correction. So if your fuel is low, your gamma t will tell you exactly what to do. Okay, if your fuel is low versus then your fuel is high. Because it takes into account the information from the sensor as to how much fuel is left in the, in the rocket engine. Isn't this also going to get into the fact that since we have uh, iterative functions and we're only going to get it to work for the region around and where the input information makes us build the function and we're not going to build an entire function for all domain x? Just no, you will have to do it for, all, for the entire domain x. So if there is some x that is not reachable, you will just remove it from your domain itself. Okay. okay? So right now we are looking at the state space model where xt can take any value in Rn. Okay? But there are, of course, variations where you have restricted set and all that, but we'll not get into it. Okay, we are doing everything where, we are doing problems where everything can be differentiated, everything is nice and clean, multiple, you can take and differentiations and all that stuff. So, okay. So the question is: This is 1950 or 1949, and this question has been posed to you. And you know how to find the open loop control, but you don't know how to find the closed loop control. So, how would you go about solving for closed loop control? Yes. Just pretend like it's an open loop problem and solve it a bunch of times. <laughs> well, it's an open loop problem in the policy space, right? right? But uh, policy space is the entire space of functions, which is pretty huge. So it's not that simple. Okay. So here is what uh, Isaac 
and Bellman came up with. And this is around 1950s. So principle of optimality is usually attributed to Bellman because he was a faculty like me and he would publish his papers. Isaac was working in a RAND Corporation, which was a military research wing in 1949. So his work was all classified and therefore the world didn't know about the principle of optimality that Isaac proposed, which is essentially the same as Bellman's principle of optimality. So they came up with what is known as principle of optimality. Bellman's principle of optimality. What he said was that if gamma 0 star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal, actually I shouldn't have if here. So gamma 0 star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal if and only if gamma t star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal. For every t, for every t, 0 to t minus 1. Okay, that's principle of optimality. Okay, so what does the principle of optimality mean? I start with a point A, I want to go to point B, I can go in a straight line, I can take a curved road. Okay. I can take multiple roads from starting from A and I want to get to B. So what Bellman is saying that if you are along, if you want to act optimally, your all future policies have to be optimal at every point of time, okay? So at every point of time, you look at the truncated policy and it has to be optimal. Yes? So what does that mean for gamma star t minus one? How do we define optimality for that point? We'll get to it in a bit. Okay, okay so let's look at this figure. Uh, let's say I pick a point in the state space here. What's the optimal way to get to B? It's the straight line. Okay. Let's say I'm standing here and I want to get to B and even though you may not notice but it's a curved line. Okay. <laughs> so I want to get from this point to B and this is not optimal because it's a curved line and we know that the shortest path is the straight line from point A to point B. Okay. So therefore this is not optimal. If I start here, again, it's a curved line. This is not optimal. I start here. It's a curved line. This is not optimal. Okay? Yes? So does this amount to a linearization process? Or is no. That just the no, this is just the okay. example. Okay? So, so if you look at this particular route, okay, no matter where you, where you truncate and look at the rest of the journey, you're always optimal. So if you truncate your process here, so this is your time t, this is your t plus 1, this is your t plus 2. No matter where you look at, the rest of the journey is optimal. Okay, the rest of the journey is in straight line, which is what the principle of optimality is. It doesn't matter, um, well I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but you don't say that you're optimal if your head is optimal. You say that you're optimal if your tail of the policy is optimal at every point of time, then you are optimal for the entire duration. So what prevents us from having a straight line being in the direction of A to B on the other side of B and saying that's optimal for some subset until we start curving back? <laughs> so you're saying that I start from here, I go all the way here, and then I go back to B? Yeah, so if you have a line that's, that's along the line segment A to B going that way, and then and it just curves back to A, because as we're building it, until we start curving back, it will be off. No, oh, if it goes all the way back to A. A, uh, yeah, because along that line segment, and uh, 
So I want to get to B, yeah. but I eventually end up getting to A. So it's so let's say let's look at the policy here. I think the right? problem is that this all seems tautological, right? We're optimal if we're optimal is basically what we're saying. That doesn't mean no, 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 no. Wait a second. So here I'm saying that the entire policy is optimal right. if the tail of the policy is optimal. Okay, it's not it's not tautological. It's saying that if so, this is an if and only if condition. So let's look at it from the reverse side. Mm -hmm. So the reverse side says, if every tail is optimal, then your entire policy is optimal, globally optimal. Okay. okay. Now that leads to an algorithm to compute the optimal policy, which if I pose the problem in this fashion, you won't be able to come up with that algorithm. Okay. And that algorithm is known as dynamic programming. Okay. So we will be able to show that the tail is optimal. Yes, so, I mean this is a this is this is a, this is called a principle of optimality, but you can actually prove it. Okay. okay? Uh, I don't have the proof uh, to, in today's class, but I'll probably prove it sometime later on okay. uh, because it's an important result. Uh, but I want to show how this leads to an algorithm of dynamic programming to compute the optimal policy. So uh, with how it's written up there. Error. It's written in a verificational format, but since it's if and only if we can make it converse in the yes. constructed form. Yes, yes, yes. You uh, have a question? Yeah. We basically are going to find uh, gamma t minus 1 and then build a way Exactly. Function. Exactly. Okay? So that's going backward. So let's look at how to compute the optimal policy. Is that clear? Any other question? Yes. So you say you don't care if the head is optimal? Yes, we don't care if the head is optimal. It will turn out. See, the thing is we want, we are interested in this thing, okay? We don't care whether the head is optimal or the tail is optimal. It just turns out that if this is optimal, then the tail has to be optimal, okay? And that can be shown. Any other question? Okay. So I want to apply the, so this is an if and only if condition. I want to find this optimal policy. So I'm going to apply the reverse part of it, starting from t equals capital T minus 1, going all the way to t equals 0. So I need to compute gamma star t minus 1 first. OK. So in order to compute gamma star t minus 1, what I have to look at is the fact that my action at time t minus 1 doesn't affect anything that happened previous to t minus 1. Okay? So I'm going to minimize the g capital T xt plus g capital T minus 1 xt minus 1, ut minus 1, plus summation t equals 0 to t minus 2, g capital T, xt, ut. Okay? And I want to minimize over ut minus 1, or, uh, yeah, so I want to find the optimal action, and that would be my gamma star t minus 1 of x t minus 1. So this would be argument actually. Argument. Yes? So what would happen if you have two gammas that are optimal? You just pick any one of them. Okay. See, uh, because the minimum is not going to change. All you are saying is argmin is different. So I have a function that looks like this. I don't care whether I get this x star or I get this x star, right? I mean, if you are looking at the optimization problem. So. Okay. Both of them are give you the same cost. Okay. So I define. I I want to compute the the optimal strategy at the final time. So, 
So what should the optimal strategy evaluated at xt minus 1 be? Well, it should be the argument of this whole optimization problem. Now one thing that we all notice is if I look at this term, it's not affected by ut minus 1. Okay? It's not dependent on u capital T minus 1. Uh, so u t minus 1 appears here. x t minus 1 is not a function of u t minus 1, but x t is a function of u t minus 1, right? Because you have this state transition equation. But this is not, this is independent of u t minus 1, so I can erase this part from the optimization problem. So the argument doesn't change, and this would be argument of u t minus 1 g capital T of f t minus 1, x t minus 1, u t minus 1, plus g capital T minus Okay, so is this step clear to everyone? So I have sum of three functions. The first two functions depend on ut minus one, the last function doesn't depend on ut minus one, so I can erase it from my optimization problem and just consider this optimization problem. And I can solve it using gradient descent or whatever is our favorite method, maybe analytically, in order to get the optimal value of ut minus one as a function of xt minus one, and I'm gonna store that information in this uh, policy gamma star t minus one. So since we don't have x t minus one, because it has to come from the uh, previous values using the earlier UTs. So x t minus one, you are going to compute it for the entire state space. So for, F, for all of Rn, you are going to run a gradient descent in order to find the argument. Oh, so the function is the argument operation itself. Yes. Okay, so we can't get any closed form of it. Once we have an xt minus one, we will then run the operation. No, 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 no. You, for every value of xt minus one in the state space, so for every value in Rn, you are going to fo solve this argument in order to get ut minus one star. For every value of xt minus one. Okay. So okay. Does that mean that in this case, it's, I mean, there are, there's an infinite number of values in Rn. Exactly. So that's the disadvantage, and that's the real problem why doing dynamic programming is so difficult. Okay. Except in the special case where the argument can be computed using some matrix operations. So for instance, if the cost was quadratic in ut minus one and xt minus one, you can actually do the matrix inversion, get the optimal solution. But if that's not the case, then of course, it's a huge memory requirement and a huge computational requirement to compute the optimal policy. Okay. Okay. So that's the disadvantage. All right. So now uh, I've computed gamma star t minus one. Now I need to compute gamma star t minus two. So let's look at that. So gamma star t minus two of x t minus two will be min argmin of u t minus two, and then min over u t minus one of g t x t plus g t minus one x t minus 1 ut minus 1 plus gt minus 2 xt minus 2 ut minus 2. Okay.
Now one thing we will notice by looking at this expression is that this minimum operation as we have argued earlier it that minimum operation does not affect this function right so i can take this function on this side and what i have is argument of ut minus 2 of And I need to put a big bracket here. OK, so the things are getting complicated. I need to find the optimal policy over the last two stages. Um, and I'm going to write that optimization problem as minimizing the sum of functions over two variables, ut minus 1 and ut minus 2. And then I recognize, for the same reason we remove this part of the optimization problem, we could actually move this here before we do the minimum, and then we have this minimum of the sum of two functions over ut minus 1, which, by the way, we have already solved here. Okay. So since I have solved for this minimum, here, I can just substitute gamma star t minus 1 here to rewrite this optimization problem as argument ut minus 2, gt minus 2 plus uh, g capital T, f capital T minus 1 x t minus 1, gamma star t minus 1, x t minus 1, OK, so that's a pretty long expression. And I want you guys to stare at the expression for some time. Okay. So instead of ut minus 1, I substituted the optimal policy for the last stage here. So what are these two terms a function of? So the last two terms here, what are they function of? They are function of xt minus 1. OK, you have a question? Yeah, where did you get uh, f of t minus 1? I know it was in the last. It's the state transition equation. OK. OK, so this is the state transition equation. We recognize that this whole thing is actually the minimum value here. And that's a function of xt minus 1 only. OK, I'm going to call this value function. OK, I'm going to give this a name, this whole optimal value a name, which is v of t minus 1. Where do I write it? I'm going to write it on top. So this will be v of t minus 1, x of t minus 1. So that's my value function at time t minus 1. OK.
Okay, so let's go back. This is the principle of optimality. It says that the tail of the policy has to be optimal. So this leads us to a decomposition problem. So I compute the gamma star t minus one first. Uh, that's the first step of the process. Uh, in order to find gamma star t minus one, I need to solve this minimization problem. Assume that we can solve it, everything is good. We can solve this minimization problem. I get two things. I get an argument and I get the minimum value, okay? So the argument will be stored as the optimal policy and the minimum value will be stored as the value function at time t minus one, which is a function of x t minus one, okay? Does that make sense? Then what does this argument becomes, this argument problem becomes equal to, so let me rewrite it. So I have argument over u t minus two of g t minus two, x t minus two, u t minus two plus v t minus one, x t minus one, okay? And now x t minus one is equal to the state transition function at time t minus two. Yes. Uh, when we f try to find out the optimal policy, uh, you said that we need to find out the argument over the ut minus one. Right. Uh, and for the x is for the uh, for the rn, right? For for all rn, yeah. For all rn. Yeah. So we have the transition function so that and we know the, what the final destination. Yes. So can we just restrict the the um, the state space? Yes, the state space? Yes, you can restrict the state space, but right now we are not considering restricted state space, restricted action space and stuff. But all of that can be done. You know, there is a theory which can be done. This is like the just simplest 101, dynamic programming 101 with no additional um, conditions or constraints, okay? Okay, this is the minimal description of what dynamic programming does without any assumptions. So. So now, again, I have argument of a function plus a future value, which I, I have already computed in this process. When I'm doing the argument, I also compute the value and I store it. And so all I have to do is sum these two functions, take the argument with respect to ut minus two, and then store the argument as policy at time t minus two and the min over ut minus two of this whole thing will be stored as the value at t minus two of x t minus two. Okay. So this is the backward recursion backward induction, I mean, th there are many names that people use. So dynamic programming, backward induction, backward recursion for dynamic programming. So these are all the terms in the literature. But this is exactly what they are doing, computing the optimal policy and the optimal value, vt minus one, then go back to stage t minus two. I want to compute this optimal policy. I'm going to have the current running cost plus the future value at a future state, and I can change the description of the state to the current state, the current action, uh, uh, which, which, is, which is taken as input to the state transition function. So now this whole objective function becomes a function of ut minus two, and you take the argument, you store it as the optimal policy, you compute the value function vt minus two, and then the 
general recursion at every point of time would be as follows. I'll have gamma star t of xt equals to arg min of gt plus vt plus 1. And this is over ut. And then I have the value function at xt, which is the min over ut of gt plus vt plus 1. Okay, so the running cost plus the future value, running cost plus the future value. Yes? So what sort of problem is this actually solvable for? Good question. So for linear quadratic problem, which is one of the most widely studied controls problem, you can do it. Now the question is where does linear and quadratic comes into picture? So typically quadratic performance index would be a tracking problem, so I want to track this particular trajectory. So I can write a quadratic objective function for tracking that trajectory. And the linear, linear part, the linear transition function would come from linearizing the plant around the nominal trajectory. So when the plane moves, okay, let's say the plane is going straight. It's a nonlinear system, but when it's going straight, you kind of know what the uh, small perturbations would be, and so you linearize the system around that nominal trajectory. Okay, and when the train, plane turns, again you linearize the system along the trajectory. And then you have a linear quadratic system, and then in that situation you can actually solve it by hand. And that's part of your assignment problem. Um, for some application, for example, the extending uh, a space Right. Um, we know that it, maybe at the end of the trip, it won't offset and go back to Earth. Right. Um, is that possible that we can um, ignore some of the state? Say if we calculate the V uh, T minus 1. Right. We obviously don't need to consider like Correct. the. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his point is can we ignore some of the states? Uh, you know, some of you might have taken 5551 or linear systems theory, and you would know something called observability. Okay, so there are some states that are observable, some states that are not observable, right? So, um, in the context of linear quadratic problem, depending upon the cost functions, it may penalize some states more than others, or it may not penalize certain states or certain configurations of state. Uh, and there is a way to transform the problem into some other state space where you can solve the problem easily and using the regular tools that you have. Okay, but you know that's going slightly deeper into the theory of dynamic programming, which will, we will not be covering in this class. But pick up a textbook on DP and you will have all these corner cases addressed within that framework. Okay, the key thing to remember here is that if you want to find the optimal pal policy, you have to start from the end, and then you have to move backwards in time. So if you want to live your life optimally, and have good and, and, and uh, you want to have the best life possible, you have to start from your retirement, actually the day you are going to die, and then the retirement, and then what you are going to do in 50s, and then 40s, and 30s, and then you will know, okay, this is what I have to do right now, based on whatever information you know, okay? So, so remember that in the case of maximum principle, oh, I, I think I've overshot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so on Friday we don't have class. In the case of maximum principle, we had open loop policy. Here what you get is a closed loop policy, closed loop optimal policy. And uh, this is the recursion to compute the optimal policy. Um, so that's it, thank you. Thank you.